Coming up on this episode of the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. This year, actually, I've been really focusing on making sure that my priorities are going where I want them to go, that I'm growing the things that are going to give me the most return on investment and I also find the most value in because I, I've been on a constant journey of learning to say no. Somebody like me who, who has all these different passions, often the hardest thing is to say no to learning something new. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 108 of the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have a delightful interview with Talina Winters, who writes books, magazine articles, a blog, musical theater. She does knitting patterns. She edits other people's work, all while drinking copious amounts of tea and hot chocolate. Talina says she is addicted to silver linings and wants to be a mermaid when she grows up. She shares insightful tidbits. She shares her creative lifelong journey. She shares sad moments that led to inspirational things to help her and other people. It's a fascinating interview, and I know you're going to love it. But before we get to that, let's start with a word from this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Rather than do an ad read myself, I'm going to play a tip about audiobook promotion codes from Will Degas from Findaway Voices. This is from an Ask Us Anything live webinar that Kevin Tumlinson and I did with Will back in October of 2019, but it's a very useful clip on how to leverage giveaway codes for your audiobook. So why not combine a little ad read with a valuable tip? Because uh, everybody who distributes with Findaway Voices gets 30 giveaway codes. If you go with our premium distribution tier called Voices Plus, you get 100. Uh, and we're always looking for ways to make those more valuable, easier to give away. We want them to drive reviews and, and uh, be reader magnets to help you get more people on your email list. What I would say is, since you have 30 or 100, I'm sure your goal for your email list is probably more than 30 or 100 people. You want more than that. Uh, so the way I would approach that is to say, I'm going to raffle off three giveaway codes every month or one giveaway code every month for everybody who uh, signs up to my mailing list this month. At the end of the month, I'm going to give one away randomly. And that sets an expectation of how many you're giving away. It's not a one-for-one -one thing. It's going to encourage a lot more people to end up on your list. And it's going to lower the burden for you so you're not constantly giving away uh, giveaway codes and using them up. And then at some point, you run out of them and you don't have your incentive anymore unless you until you publish your next book. But that would be a great way to stretch those a little bit further. If you're looking for a way to kind of give them out and validate that you're giving them to people who are actually going to leave reviews, there's a company called Story Origin down in Austin, Texas. I don't know if you've heard of them before, but they just released an audiobook review feature that's really great. And it's a way for you to give away your Find Away Voices giveaway codes or your ACX codes if you're using ACX. And the way it works is you kind of you set up a landing page and then you point people to that landing page and reviewers, uh, listeners have profiles there and they say, OK, I want to review your book and they, they apply. And then you get a list of applicants and you get to see their past histories. So if this person's requesting a ton of books and they're never actually leaving a review, you're going to see they have like a, a zero or a 10 percent review rate. You're going to say, OK, I'm not going to give one of my codes to that person. If somebody has like an 80, 90, 100 percent review rate, you're like, yes, that's the person that I want to give this code to because I know it's going to result in a review from them. So take a look at Story Origin. They just released this feature last week. It's still uh, brand new. We have a little write up on our blog, uh, blog.findawayvoices.com, or you can just check out Story Origin. Uh, I believe it's completely free right now. So there's there's no reason not to use it. It's a nice little layer on top of uh, giveaway codes. And that's the clip and tip from Will from Findaway Voices. If you want to learn more about Findaway Voices, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. 
Thank you so much for your recent comments and tweets. Uh, among them, Lynn Worthen commented on episode 105, which was the episode on location-based storytelling. And Lynn said, So many possibilities with the voice doubling as the technology improves. Your clips had a bit of reverb to them that initially had me thinking you were recording on the road. I also like the potential the location-based apps provide for authors to share stories beyond those offered by the pricey commercial walking tours. You are now passing the alley where evil vampire chick feasted on a team of rugby players. Walk quickly. She likes to lurk there in the shadows and is almost always hungry. <laughs> Thanks so much, Lynn. Knowing the way that you like to expand upon creativity and experiment with different publishing options, I'm sure you're going to have a lot of fun with that. And I'm looking forward to uh, you getting involved and letting me know uh, what you've created in that area. Thanks for leaving a comment on episode 105. Some of the comments on Twitter in the last week or so came from Arthur Slade, who tweeted, File this under fun, being interviewed by the honorable and witty Mark Leslie for his excellent Stark podcast about publishing. Of course, Arthur also said, It was so much fun to be interviewed by Mark Leslie, he laughed at at least half of my jokes. <laughs> That's not true, Arthur. I laughed at three quarters of your jokes. It was just that one where you mocked me a little. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, thanks, Arthur. It was great to have you on the show and also great to uh, see those comments on Twitter. You can leave comments for me on the show at starkreflections.ca or you can at me on Twitter. I'm at Mark Leslie. You can also check me out over on Instagram. I'm at Mark Leslie Lefebvre. <laughs> And now in terms of a brief personal update, I believe I did mention that I already completed NaNoWriMo. I clocked in at over 60,000 words before the end of the month, so I was really, really pleased with that. And a good portion of the writing was on the book that I'm going to talk about in a second. But it was great because I also uh, worked on a couple of other book projects and got little bits and pieces of extra writing done. So that was fantastic. I hope that your NaNoWriMo went really, really well. Now, Talita Winters, who is the guest on this podcast, actually recently interviewed me for an article on her blog, and it's called Mark Leslie Lefebvre Finds His Voice, and I'll have a link to that in the show notes. It's uh, interesting to go back and read that an interview she had done with me to compose the article, because there were things that I said in it that I forgot I mentioned. It was kind of interesting to go back and read that, even though it wasn't all that long ago. <laughs> in terms of other personal updates, Lindsay... Andrea and Joe had me on as a guest for episode 13 of the Six Figure Authors Podcast. It's a great new podcast. I'm really enjoying the content. One of the things I love about it is when they go out and are in the world. So Joe and Lindsay were at Nink, and uh, Lindsay was at 20 Books to 50K, and Andrea was at the WMG Publishing Workshop. And I love the fact that they're sharing their experiences there. Now, I had to be clear, as I was a guest on the Six Figure Author podcast, I had to make sure that they knew right up front and the listeners knew that I am only a five-figure author and not yet a six-figure author, but I'm working there. I'm working on it and I'm working really, really hard. But of course, they, they made a wonderful exception for me because apparently I, I know stuff or, or my jokes are good. I don't know what it was, but they at least had me on the show and it was a lot of fun. And that is a podcast I think you'll probably benefit from listening to. Uh, last personal update, my December release, An Author's Guide to Working with Libraries and Bookstores, came back from my editor just the other day, and I made the updates and the edits really quickly, kind of working late at night, getting up early in the morning to get that ebook produced and loaded in time for the release on December 10th, 2019. Now, I'm still working on formatting it into the print edition, which I'm hoping to be available by December 17th. And I'm going to be simultaneously working to get the audiobook out before the end of December. Now, I will be sharing early audio drafts from the audiobook that I'm working on of some of the chapters from the book prior to the book's availability in audiobook. And they'll be available to my patrons who support this podcast for as little as $1, $3, or $5 a month over at patreon.com slash starkreflections. And I'm doing that because, well, my patrons are so cool. And it's fun to give them extra stuff. You can check out An Author's Guide to Working with Libraries and Bookstores, which is on pre-order now as I record this on December 5th. And it is coming out on December 10th, Tuesday, December 10th. And you can check out the links to all retailers that it's on over at books2read.com slash working 
with libraries and bookstores. Well, that's it for my personal update. Let's get right into the interview with Felina. Hey, Talina, thank you so much for hanging out with me here today. Thanks for having me, Mark. This has been, this is a pleasure. <laughs> so this is, this is interesting because when I look at what you're doing as a, as a creative person, um, you're doing uh, newsletters and things like that. You're, you're an author, you're writing books, but you also send out messages of books and inspiration. You've got knitting patterns that you share. You have a Patreon where you're also informing and sharing and working within a community. You're doing things on social media. You're inter interacting and connecting with people. With all of this stuff going on. Oh, and I forgot to mention, of course, you have a beautiful family and you've got this big family and, and, and that obviously is very important to you as well. So apart from the fact, you know, there's only 24 hours in a day, you probably get a few hours of sleep, you know, <laughs> when you're not emailing people at one in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Little inside joke there for, for a good recent communication that we've had with one another by email. But I guess I, what I want to say is, as a creative person who has all of these things in orbit, uh, how do you how do you define yourself if you meet someone at a cocktail party and they say, well, what do you do? Well, um, I usually narrow it down to a few because I find people get a little overwhelmed if you give them this really long list. So <laughs> I <laughs> I usually lead with I'm a writer and an editor and a knitwear designer, and that's okay. where I've kind of narrowed it down to the last few years because honestly, that's where my focus has been. Uh, despite the fact that I have done a lot of different things in my life. There are only 24 hours in a day, and I, I teach this when I teach my cohesive branding class for multi-passionate entrepreneurs. Um, what you focus on is what's growing, and so that's what I have been focusing on, although I've recently decided I need to narrow that even further, and I'm in the process of, of basically letting my knitwear design business kind of just coast and, um, and focusing on being a writer and editor because that is where my true passion is. Okay, uh, let's go back to the beginning uh, a little bit. Um, in terms of knitwear and writing, you know, uh, what came first? What was that? What was that creative? Where did you spend that creative energy initially? Was it knitting? Was it was it storytelling writing? Okay, I'm gonna have to see if I can keep this really condensed. Um, okay. <laughs> I didn't grow up wanting to be a writer, although okay. I did enjoy creative writing. I actually wanted to be a musician. I always said if I went to college, it would be for music. And I eventually did. When I got out of high school, actually, I, I was totally burned out because I was one of those keeners that kind of overloaded myself. I had a full-time job plus a, a more than full course load. And I got out of high school. <laughs> I'm like, I'm never going back to school. <laughs> um, but within two years, I did change my mind and I went back to... Um, Red Deer College, which is a community college near where I lived, and I took music and with a with a um, composition focus because I had written songs, and so I wanted to be. I thought, well, maybe I can be a professional songwriter. Now that was in 1998. The music industry was changing quite a bit, okay. and as it turns out, I ended up getting married on my very same day as my college graduation because we had to book our hallway before. <laughs> well, but you, you got married on the same day you graduated. Two, two significant moments in life <laughs> the same day. We didn't go to the grad. We figured the wedding was <laughs> actually it was my husband was in the same college. It was his grad day too. It was hilarious. Oh, you, so wait, and you both graduated at the same. It could have yeah. been you got your diplomas and then met together and then someone married you right before you got off stage, right? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're keeners, you know, we could have maybe tried to work both ceremonies in, but no, we, we just stuck to the wedding and then we went on our honeymoon. Uh, anyway, so then within a short amount of time, um, started having a family and uh, even though I was writing music and, um, you know, it was, a, I have I had this huge dream. I'd actually, in college, I'd started to, co I'd co started a, a musical, a full length full scale Broadway musical type of musical with a friend of mine wow. that was a passion project for us. And over the years had worked on that. Um, but both of us, again, the same thing, we both got married around the same time, we both started having kids and really focused on our families. And so I, that was a deliberate choice of mine to put that dream aside for a while. I'm like, my kids are only small for a sh short amount of time. And um, I'd rather spend this time with them and then I'll have time to come back to my career later. Uh, which I did, but also in that time, probably about 10 years, I really needed a creative outlet. And I actually didn't start, to, I didn't learn to knit until I was pregnant with my first child. 
but you know, so over time I kind of self taught myself um, some things and like the internet was still kind of new. Now knitting is wonderful on the internet, but at the time I found one tutorial that told me one stitch and I kind of reverse engineered that, remembering what my grandma taught me when I was five. Anyways, eventually got quite passionate about knitting. At the same time, um, you know, this whole musical project kept coming back around for at various times for various reasons. My, my co-writer and I, Candace Marshall, we're both very passionate about it and we do want to see it produced, but uh, point being, I, I, I was learning a lot about the craft of storytelling at the time, as well as songwriting, but um, I, I read a bunch of books about how to write the Broadway musical and realized we needed some revisions. So we had a couple of years there where we did have some really intense focus on that. And then at the same time, like when my third one was born, three years after my first one, uh, so I had like little ones all together. <laughs> Lots of little people. <laughs> Yeah, wow, it's just like it's just like bang. We just can walk by each other in the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, we actually when my when my young my third son was a month old, uh, we moved to a new town. We moved to Peace River, where we live now. And I didn't really know anyone. It was the end of December, so it was a really terrible time for getting out and about. Especially we're in a, we're in a northern community. Winters are kind of hard. Um, and it's a wonderful community, but it does take a while to kind of get in and figure out, you know, where people are every time you move like that. So it was like, that was 2000, the end of 2005, beginning of 2006 and blogging was like this big thing. And somebody sent me, my, my friend that likes to write started a blog and I saw her first post. I'm like, oh, I must do this. <laughs> <laughs> I started blogging actually as a way of keeping in touch with the family and friends that we had left behind and found this amazing community um, and a wonderful creative outlet. I just, I loved the writing. And so, um, so that's 2006. And then you were asking about how I got into the knitting. Um, so I blogged for years. And then uh, by 2010, I had already designed several of my own patterns and people were asking because it, because the knitting community was really taking off online too. Mm -hmm. Knitters are a really techno savvy bunch. And uh, there was a, a website called Ravelry, which is still around today. It's the social networking for, for knitters and, and fiber enthusiasts. And, uh, and people were like, is there a pattern for this somewhere? And I'm like, no, <laughs> you should design them. Like I'm not the designer, but I eventually I did start putting some patterns out there just for fun and decided I would sell them on Etsy and that's kind of how that got started. So these things were all just kind of creative outlets that I just ended up eventually turning into businesses for a while there. It's like I just couldn't do something and not make money from it, which is partly because I was staying home with my kids. I eventually started homeschooling them and I really wanted to be able to contribute financially to my family without having to go out. I'm such an introvert. <laughs> <laughs> I, I sold Pampered Chef until my until my uh, second son was born. I think is when I stopped that, and I was going out two, three nights a week in winter. And I was just like, yeah, I don't want to do that anymore. I just want to stay home. So that's how I learned to speak, even though it's still. <laughs> 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 but I, I got comfortable with small groups. We'll probably talk more about that later. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, that's something that never changes, right? You may get good at it, but it doesn't mean that it, you're a natural at it. It means you still have to get into your zone for yeah. uh, removing from that introversion and in, into a into public society and into social spaces. Absolutely. You had <laughs> mentioned, so you talked about, okay, you're looking at knitting and, and, and writing, and writing's going to be probably taking precedent. What, what what was the first book? What what how was that experience for you when you started to you went from this uh, dream and this and it's probably an ongoing thing is the musical, uh, you know, yes. writing music to the musical then to a different form of writing which is like text prose novels. Uh, your first uh, the first published book I believe was an inspirational romance. Did I yeah. get that right? Um, yeah, how, did. Where did when did that all come about in in the midst of all of this all these moving parts? <laughs> well. Um... So I, as I said, I, I found quite a blogging community and uh, some people would tell me once in a while that you should write a book. And probably because I'm addicted to fiction, I had been a fiction enthusiast, let's say, since I could learn how to read at the age of three and drove my parents insane asking them to read Hop on Pop. Um, 
<laughs> so then I eventually learned to read myself because they wouldn't anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, I just always heard you should write a novel. I, it didn't occur to me because I wasn't a huge, at that time, I hadn't read a ton of memoir. I hadn't read, um, you know, all the nonfiction I read was basically how-to stuff or historical stuff. And it just like, it just didn't occur to me. So I was like, well, I don't have any ideas. I don't know how to write fiction. I knew that, I mean, I'd written some in high school, but I, it wasn't my passion. And I'm like, eh, eh. <laughs> but then in 2010, I was watching um, the uh, Young Adult Mermaid series H2O because mermaids have been my little secret, not so secret passion since I was quite little, yeah. way before the mermaid ever came out. And, um, and I had this idea. I was like watching this show and it was like not long after Pirates of the Caribbean, I think two came out with the mermaids that were, you know, the vampire mermaids. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, why are mermaids always having to drag sailors to the bottom of the sea? Where are all the mermen? Like, what's the deal? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden my brain started going, answering this question. And um, I got an idea for a world that just kept growing and growing and I did research and it kept growing and I was like this is amazing if I want to read something of this I'm gonna to have to write it right. and so I went and I took a course from Holly Lyle um, I took her uh, how to think sideways novel writing course and as practice for that course I started writing this inspirational romance story now I'm still homeschooling my kids at the time I had um, my oldest three uh, were all in school that year they were in grades like one Nope, they were grade, yeah, a grade one and like three and four, I think is how, how it was split up. And um, a year before that, we had also adopted a one-year-old and his name was Levi. And, uh, you know, so he had been keeping me busy for, for a while. No, wait, I'm getting this mixed up. So this is still 2010. Yeah, so I took this course kind of in the midst of this adoption process. I was like trying to, you know, it, it was a little intense, but it was, it was awesome. It was a huge blessing to our family. But uh, so I'm homeschooling and then it gets to December and I would always take December off right. and do some things for me. So I was sewing, which has been something I've loved to do since I was a kid. And I had this idea like, well, I wonder what, what, what it would take for someone to be a self-taught couture sewist. Um, and so then that got my idea for this course, which I then write, wrote the story and showed it to my mom. And she's like, this is amazing. I'm like, oh, great, mom. Thanks. And then that's right. Three months later, that's when we adopted our son. So it went in a drawer. I did not have time to deal with it. We had a, a year of uh, very intense times with that whole transition process because it was very quickly. It wasn't something we had planned to do, nor had the other family planned to give him up. Right. Um, so it was, it was good. Um, they're family friends of ours. So that in case anybody's wondering, like, how does this happen? Um, yeah. The, yeah. So that was, that was amazing. But yeah, the story was in a drawer. Um, I wasn't doing anything with it until, you know, after about a year. And then my mom's like, you should do something with that story. I'm like, my mom is amazing. She's so supportive, but she would love anything. She would love my grocery list. <laughs> <laughs> it's unputdownable. I could not put this down when I was going through the grocery store. <laughs> she's fantastic. And I love her. And she's actually now, um, I, I've been able to, uh, she was my first hire this summer. She's helping me run my business, which awesome. is awesome. I need <laughs> she's it. a very supportive staff member, isn't she? <laughs> she is. Yeah. Anytime I need to feel good moment, I just call up my staff member and say, Hey, <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, so I, I thought, well, okay, as part of the course, Holly had gone through the process of self-publishing, and I knew this book was too small to be commercial, because it was just a novella length, um, and it was, you know, but I was like, well, it would be good to self to practice that, so I, I, I went, and I, through the process of finding an editor, finding a graphic designer, um, and, and did this with this little book, which... Uh, I, I really lucked out and found an amazing and very affordable editor who was a fantastic writing coach. So she took me to the next level and really opened my eyes to see how much the revision process is a huge part of make, making your story fantastic. Right. She's, I attribute her to, to the reason why I, I now do developmental editing because it's just, it's so awesome. Um, 
anyway, so yeah, that I, I at that point still didn't know if I obviously I wasn't like I want to be a writer. Um, but during that process of, of adopting our son, one of the things that had changed in our life because I was so so busy to the max already is that my older three children started going to a local school. There was only one thing in my life that I could give and it was homeschooling. Right. So <clears throat> they went to school and, and I was just, I had been home for a year with our youngest son. And, uh, and so that's when I had kind of the time a little bit to work on this. I did have right. another online business at the time selling saddle pads, believe it or not. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> not, even on my website. Uh, but that was actually what I was doing for income at the time to bring in a little bit of extra income into our family is I had an eBay business where I would sell these really high quality saddle pads, which my mother's company manufactured. Um, <laughs> yes, you know, we're a family of <laughs> entrepreneurs. Yes. Anyway. Um, so yeah. And then in between that, I, I, I got this book ready to publish and started to get an inkling of what I wanted to do with my life. I was at a, a transition point where I wasn't, I mean, I was 24 seven caregiver for our youngest son, but I was no longer, my time wasn't so intensely, you know, taken up with everything else to do with my children. I had this time during the day that I knew even, you know, in a few years, my, my youngest son would be in school as well. And I would have more time finally to put that career back on a front burner. And so I actually got a speaking job that spring and, um, you know, and I, I, I had been on, on the web internet for a long time by then already as a musician and as a blogger. And so I was starting to get this idea of that I wanted to be somebody who was an inspirer an encourager. I've always been an encourager. It's something that's been part of my personality. And I really started to see that as something I wanted to use as a business model. I wasn't sure how that was going to look yet. <clears throat> So anyway, um, got this book all ready to publish, and uh, it was June of 2015. And um, finally, I, did, I decided I was gonna I was gonna use Ingram Spark. You know, I was gonna go wide. I'd done all my research, so I wrestled with getting this book file up onto Ingram Spark for hours and I was a night owl at the time just because well I've always been a night owl but I, that was when I would do my work because that's when the kids were asleep right. um and so I worked on this file until like 3 a.m finally got it uploaded and um uh that next morning unfortunately my my youngest son who was three he had just turned three a month two months before that um he was, he was quite busy, quite headstrong, and he decided to be quite clever to hide behind his daddy's truck while daddy was taking the boys to school. So, and I know I warned you about that in advance. And, um, yeah, so we lost our son this, that morning and that threw obviously our whole lives for a loop. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it was very public. Uh, as I said, I was a blogger. Um, we went into the hospital, and two hours later, we came out, and uh, and we have an, a fantastic community. Um, so, I mean, I already had messages on my voicemail from professional colleagues. I'm a piano teacher. That's how I'm actually using that college education. I teach piano. And it was like one of my, yeah, the piano teachers in town was like, you know, I just heard the news. If you need anything at all, you know, and we're going to be bringing casseroles. And I was just, I was blown away by the response of our community. Um, and I've lived in small communities all my life, but Peace River is probably uh, exceptional in this way. Right. Uh, anyway, so at that point, I didn't really know what I was going to do, but everything had changed. And um, we were going into summer holidays, so then my other kids were home. But then going into that fall, um, that was the first time I had, in like 12 or 13 years, I had been alone, not a 24-7 caregiver. Right. and um I was obviously grieving there was a lot of trauma to get over I had PTSD to deal with um and how we lost him and didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life I I wasn't enjoying the 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 saddle pad business anymore my mom had actually sold that company and um it had it had always been a bit of a struggle it was a lot of time invested for how little I made from it but it was worth it to me because it was it enabled me to stay home with my kids but you know with the, some of the changes that were happening in, in the economy and in with the new owners how they were handling things like i just i wanted to get out of that 
and I wanted to do something that was closer to my passion, which was in the arts. <clears throat> so um, that fall, uh, I'd say probably by about, it was around January of the following year where I really started to, to think that I was ready to, to make some plans. And I just, for anyone listening, who's like January, June to January, you're already making plans. Well, for one thing, I had done a lot of grief work, but it's not like I was like, yes, I'm going to make plans. I just needed, I needed something to look forward to. I right. needed something that wasn't all grief all the time. Cause I, I was a pretty bad wreck. Um, and making my plans for that year, my goals for that year, I, I wrote down, and I think I even blogged about it, that by October of that year, I wanted to be done. I wanted to walk away from my saddle pad selling business and be spending more of my time writing. I, I, I don't want to say I was right. I wanted to be writing full time, but I wanted to be making an income of some kind from writing. Right. See, that was the point I would say where I knew I wanted to be a writer when I grew up. I know all my social media says I'm an aspiring mermaid, but <laughs> <laughs> still haven't figured out how to do that. Right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's more like an attitude thing. Uh, I'm a little high strung sometimes. So I think a mermaid is, is, is pretty chill and I would like to be more like that. So <laughs> anyway, um, so, so yeah, I, I, uh, few months later was going into the post office in my town and there was a big billboard, uh, ad that said creatives for hire and it was advertising our local regional magazine by the way I was already part way into writing my second novel at that point but I knew that that wasn't going to make me money anytime soon so um the the creatives for hire I looked at that and I thought huh and I'm like this magazine isn't very old it's fantastic it was only a few years old at the time and everybody I knew loved it. I loved it. It was one of those things you get it and you read it cover to cover because you know half the people in there and it's a really good feel good magazine about our region. And I'm like, huh, I wonder if they would hire me. So I called them up. I went into the post office, came out, sat in my car, looked at the phone number, called them up and said, hey, I would like to write for you. And I was so scared. <laughs> But I'm like, I have no training. Like it was just, it was just like, I'd like to write for you. And, um, the editor, uh, Torme, he was just like, well, what have you done? What did you show me? And so I said, well, I've got some blog posts. So I sent him some of my best blog posts that were probably the most journalistic. Right. And, uh, and he says, sure. And he's like, a really, he's so laid back. I love him. Uh, but he's just like a throw her in and see what happens kind of a training model. So okay, he's like, sure, sure. Is this thing happening next week. Can you go there and cover that? I'm like, sure. <laughs> 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 I didn't even remember on my phone at the time. And uh, within probably a year, I was writing mostly lead stories. And now they're lead writer. I've been with them for four years. And that has been an excellent stepping stone in my step path of being a writer as well, giving me a lot of confidence. But yeah, it was kind of a long way of getting to the point where I, I, oh, I forgot to mention. And then by October of that year, yes, I did actually close the doors on that saddle pad business. My right. supplier bought the company because they didn't want to lose the eBay presence. So I even made a little money and walked away and I started t um, teaching piano full time. Well, more part time and then spending more time on writing. Wow. So it's the teaching the piano, a very creative, helping other people with their creativity and passion. It's writing fiction. It's writing articles with this um, a magazine a journal mm -hmm. as well. Um, do you still blog as well uh, on, on top of that? Are you still, are you still do? I know you're sharing stuff in social media, but is blogging part of that experience? Absolutely. Um, I actually have an inspirational blog. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm smiling because I just interviewed Mark for my blog. <laughs> I actually, I didn't know if it was for your blog or for uh, an article you were writing for someone else, to be quite honest. So. Well, no, that one's for my blog. So um, I, I, I try to blog several times a month and most of the time it is just about me and kind of like little updates about my life and my writing kind of right. stuff that doesn't fit elsewhere. Like my newsletter, I've decided to, I've been trying to focus more on posting content that used to go mostly on social media on my blog, because okay. um, having been blogging now for so long, I, I can easily see how content that I've put up there many, many years ago is still drawing traffic to my website. Right. Whereas anything I put on social media is out there and gone. And not okay. saying there isn't value to that, but I am still, I am definitely trying to, keep those life updates within my own 
property, basically. Okay. Um, so yes, but as well as that, within the last couple of years, to go along with that inspirational theme, and also because I now have these journalism skills, um, I I interview people who inspire me, and I figure if they inspire me, they'll inspire my readers, and then I um, I write about them and I put put that up on my blog as well. So um, yeah, that's a great great way for me to network with other people, like you do with your podcast, and. Um, and just be able to give really good value to them and to my readers and, and kind of spread goodwill. They're not all writers or, or creatives. Um, I've, I've, unfortunately, I don't get to interview as many people as I'd like to. Some people don't ever get back to me. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I, have, I have interviewed like knitters and I've interviewed, um, I interviewed someone who's an influencer and just had a really amazing story. Like just, and it's not something I have time to do as, as much as I'd like either because I'm pretty busy with other stuff, but I get as much on there as I can. So how do you, how do you divide up the time? I mean, you've got family time, you've got, you know, multiple jobs, right? Like part-time uh, work. And then you've got the passion and you've got the blog, you've got the Patreon account where you're providing content for people who are, are you know, avid to receive it. And then you're also writing fiction, you're writing novels. How do you, how do you divide up your time to, to make sure you can get it all done? Good question, Mark. I'm not sure that I'm an expert. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow you make it happen though. I do make it happen. Um, so this year, actually, I've been really focusing on making sure that my priorities are going where I want them to go, that I'm growing the things that are going to give me the most return on investment. And I also find the most value in because I, I'm, I've been on a constant journey of learning to say no, as you can, I mean, somebody like me who, who has all these different passions, often the hardest thing is to say no to learning something new. Right. And, and, and following that new bunny trail or whatever it is. Um, and so I've had to kind of over the years, I put, I put composing and, and, and songwriting on a back burner. A few years ago, I realized that wasn't my passion anymore. I wanted to be a writer and, and that's okay. It's not like it's not ever going to happen as far as getting that musical out there, but where that's at, it needs a lot of money and, and a lot of collaboration from other people to take it to the next level. We've got, We've got much got it as far as we can get it on our own kind of thing, which is fine. We just don't have that investment capital right now. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so, you know, put that aside. And then this fall, I, I actually spent a whole bunch of time super analyzing exactly how much time all of my different business activities took. I put it all in an Excel spreadsheet. And then I was just like, wow, no wonder I always feel behind. And I always feel like my list is getting longer, not shorter. And I'm frustrated that I don't, that I'm not progressing on writing my fiction as fast as I want. And I still have that to a certain degree, but um, it really helped me to prioritize. That's when I start, started to step back from social media a bit. I discovered that you don't have to spend as much time on social media as you think for people to remember who you are right. and to give them value. Um, most people don't even notice if you disappear. So writers out there that get stressed out that you have to be on social media. You 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 should be, but you don't have to be out there five times a day because okay. that can eat up your whole life. Um, and you know, and then I do have these cycles. Like the the magazine I work for is quarterly. So six weeks out of every three months, I spend a lot of time working on that. But in right. the other six weeks, then I can spend, I call them my flex hours, working on other things. So I can schedule in editing for other people. And then I get, a, I'm, I'm working on trying to get some time in on my own fiction every week, regardless, but it is, it is a challenge sometimes. Um, and yeah, I also started using an app called Timely, which yep. isn't free except for the first two weeks, but it is fantastic uh, because it has an AI that it basically just runs in the background on your devices and it tracks everything you do. Right. And so, um, I, you know, it, it, you stop lying to yourself at that point. <laughs> <laughs> what you're actually spending time on? Yeah, exactly. I was researching cat videos. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, and then I, I, I am also able to see exactly how much time is logged, uh, every week on actual work. Um, and for me at this point, because I'm always feel, I was always feeling so stressed and so behind my challenge was often making sure that I didn't work on the weekend so that I could spend that time with my family, which is really important to me. And so 
it's important. I, I talk about this in my newsletters a lot because it's something I need to learn that every time I say yes to something, I'm actually saying no to something else I've already said yes to. So I need to make sure that if I'm saying yes to something, it's not taking away from those things that are hugely important to me, like spending time with my family. My oldest son graduates this year and he's going away to college in the spring. And so I'm just, I'm really feeling that. This year. Like I really want to make sure those weekends are, are spent with my family. Wow. So yeah, um, I guess it's, 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 it's a constant process of prioritization. And as I mentioned earlier, um, even, even just within the last few weeks, I've had to look at how much time I spend designing a knitwear pattern versus how much money that pattern will make for me in the long run. And right. as much as I love to help knitters and, um, and just, and I love, I love knitting. That's not going to change because it's my, it's my sanity time. But, but the pattern production itself isn't very hugely money making. So okay. <laughs> yeah, I've actually <laughs> decided to, to put that aside. It, it is a constant source of income and I'm not going to shut it down by any stretch, but I I've had to tell myself, you, you don't get to design any more patterns to put out for public use unless you're just doing it for fun. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there it is. You have to, you still have to prioritize. You still have to decide how you're spending your time. Well, I, and I think this last question I'm going to ask you, I, I think it probably, I suspect, uh, based on chatting with you, that it speaks to priorities in life. Now, on your website, there's a quote that says, the universe is made of stories, not of atoms. And I'm, I imagine you place that there probably because of priorities. Is that right? Is there a reason? Like, why? why what's the story behind that quote? Well, um, so because I have all these different aspects of my brand that I bring together on my website, um, uh, I had to find something that, that brought them, that was kind of the, the unifying thread and inspiration and encouragement is one of them, but I am passionate about stories and, um, the stories of my life, which, you know, I've had more than just the loss of my son to grieve. There's been a lot of other things farther back. Um, they're, they're what define me. They're what have made me who I am. And that's also what defines each one of us. And, um, I would say that one of the things that grief did is just allowed me to give other people a lot more grace and realize that we're all really, uh, re we're all dealing with something. We all have our own story and you just have no idea what's going on behind somebody else's head. So I, I looked at everything I did and I realized is that it's it's about stories that's what i do i tell stories whether it's with with my um songwriting or or even knitting a lot of my patterns were literary or tv inspired um or, or editing it's just it's all about stories and i just i am fascinated by hearing other people's stories and also getting a chance to tell them and it, it's really an honor awesome well uh because you've inspired me i'm sure you've inspired my listeners where can people go to find out more about you uh, well, my website, talinawinters.com, and that's T-A-L-E-N-A-W-I-N-T-E-R-S.com. And then I'm also all over social media. Most places, I'm just at Talina Winters. Um, I'm most active on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. I'm fairly active. Mostly I'm Instagram. I, I, I'm active on Instagram, and then it just kind of goes out other places, but I'm still in those other places responding to people. I have an author page on Facebook at talinawinters.artist and then I have a separate one for knitting at my secret wish by Talina and yeah that's it and also I have that monthly newsletter I got told this summer by one of my readers it's the best author newsletter ever I have to say like that was a pretty good feeling <laughs> that's a good feeling yeah I <laughs> so I'm like well now I don't feel any pressure at all I have to keep this up <laughs> Talina thank you so much for hanging out with me here today Oh, thank you so much, Mark. This is great. Thank you. I love listening back to that interview with Talina. And there's a couple things that you talked about that I think are really, really important when you're thinking about all the things you need to do as a writer, all the things you want to do as a writer. And that's the importance of saying no. There's a couple things there. The first one is when she says, every time you say yes to something, you say no to something else. And that's the 
importance of prioritizing. Yeah, you want to do all the things. You want to be able to work on different projects and go to places and do different things, but you can't do all of them because your time is limited. So every time you say yes to one thing, it may mean saying no to something else. And so that's where you have to pause and prioritize, which I think is critical. And then the other thing that she points out that I think is really important is she says you don't have to be on social media all the time to be visible and available. This means you can be on social media without it having to be a time suck. She talks about some tools that she uses in terms of timing uh, what she's spending her time on, and that's one thing you can do. The other thing that can be valuable is scheduling your time. The way you would schedule your time for writing, you would say, okay, I'm going to be on social media. I'm going to maybe I'll dip in for 20 minutes here or half an hour here or an hour. And one of the things that I do, because I do manage a lot of different Facebook pages for some of my nonfiction paranormal books, such as Haunted Hospitals or Spooky Sudbury or Haunted Hamilton, etc., is I'll go in and pre schedule, I'll spend an hour pre scheduling a week's worth of posts so that I am on social media and I'm relevant. You can pre-schedule tweets using TweetDeck and other tools. And so you can actually be constantly having content coming out. And then once a day or whatever uh, schedule you feel comfortable with, so it's not too much time suck, you can be alerted to uh, or pay attention to alerts and notifications. So again, you can reduce your social media time, which can be actually depressing and, and, and a downer and be an amazing procrastinator's time suck. But uh, you can reduce it without having to completely get rid of it, at least for me anyways, because I find that I do have to be on social media in order to respond to things from the author community. So I can't just get rid of it altogether. I have to come up with ways to strategize and use it more effectively and more efficiently. So remember, saying no and being able to schedule or limit your time on things that take time away from you and your writing and your publishing and all the things that you do to be successful. Well, I hope you found this episode useful and helpful. If you did like this episode, I'd appreciate you either leaving a review on the podcast or better yet, sharing the podcast with someone that you think would find great value in it. That does mean so much to me. It means so much to me that you are listening to this podcast. So thank you for listening to this podcast. Again, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre. And until next week and next episode, here's wishing you great writing and good stark reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.